Hi, it's Ms. Bastido here to talk about our last video in Unit 4, uh, which is macroevolution. Um, this will be the last video for Unit 4, which kind of wraps um, up all the videos for this year. So we're just going to start with a um, quick statement. We've already defined macroevolution in another video, um, but we... As a reminder, macroevolution is all of these really small genetic changes or bits of microevolution that accumulate over long periods of time, and that leads to speciation. So remember, speciation is formation of a new species. So you see here, if we have all these tiny changes, and as they accumulate, it can lead to the formation of a new species. And we know that it's a new species when the two um, species can no longer breed with each other. Um, and have some sort of reproductive isolation, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. So there are four patterns of evolution that you need to know about in this course, and so they are divergent, convergent, coevolution, and parallel evolution. Um, it's likely that you've spent probably some time in the past talking more about divergent and maybe even a little bit about a convergent, but these two might be a bit new for you, so we'll go into to each of these in detail. And so with divergent evolution, this is over time that because of different selective pressures, um, individuals um, or populations, I should say, accumulate traits that are different from each other. <clears throat> and so these different traits allow them to survive better in their own environment or um, different selection pressures. So an example of this is those Galapagos finches that we've discussed previously. And so the finches have a common ancestor um, that came from the South American mainland, and they have slowly diverged into all these different beak types. It's more than just their beaks, but the beaks are um, kind of the prominent feature that's changed over time. And these are based on the types of food that were available on these different islands. Um, and so in the large beaks, they might have a large ground fish was probably eating really large seeds um, that were on the ground. Um, whereas a cactus might have, a cactus finch might have uh, more of a pointy uh, beak so it could pierce the cactus. And you can kind of read through those, but it, essentially what's happened over time is that they've become dissimilar and that is because they are under different selective pressures. And so we call that divergent, meaning they're going away from each other, becoming more different. Um, one evidence for divergent evolution is homologous structures. And so you can see here, homologous means that the structure underneath is the same, even though the function on the outside might be different. So if we use a human, a dog, a bird, um, or even a bat wing would work, and a whale, we see that the same sort of bone structure exists, which is one bone followed by two, followed by um, some smaller bones, and then um, again, some longer, but, but still small bones. And so in humans, this is the humerus and the radius and the ulna and the carpals and the metacarpals and the phalanges. And we can see that the, this bone structure, while it does change to some extent, the basic structure of it has remained the same, despite obviously a whale having a much different function than our, than our arm. And so this is evidence that they must have a common ancestor um, to have these similar structures. Convergent evolution is sometimes confusing to students. It is really showing that two distantly related organisms have adapted independently to have similar features. And so really good examples of this are placental mammals in North America and Australian marsupials. And so we can see that the mole in um, the marsupial mole and the placental mole, they have a lot of the similar features, and that's because they are under similar environmental pressures. And so those similar environmental pressures have caused them um, to adapt similarly because they live in similar environments, but they are not closely related. Um, obviously, they do have a common ancestor somewhere back in the line, but not they're not closely related. Um, same with the mouse, the marsupial mouse versus uh, this mouse, the lemur, um, the flying squirrel, all of these bobcats and uh, 
and wolves and Tasmanian wolves, all of those things, they all have these marsupial counterparts that are here in Australia, but they um, are not really very related, but they have similar adaptations because they live in similar environments. Um, you could even use the example here of the bat wing and the bird wing and the insect wing. Obviously, all, none of these are closely related to each other, but their, their wing structure on the outside is the same. But if you were to look on the inside, the actual structures on the inside are different. We call these analogous structures. So it's different than homologous. With homologous, the structure underneath was the same and the function on the outside was different. In this case, the structure on the inside is different but the, the structure on the outside is the same, and that's because of they're under similar environmental pressures, but they aren't closely related, so the, the structures underneath are actually quite different. With coevolution, what we're looking at is an evolutionary change that occurs uh, between two species that are interacting with each other. This a lot of times happens with predator and prey, also sometimes with mutualistic species, so species that are helping each other. And so here's an example um, of a bird that's feeding on um, this butterfly. So this butterfly that I cannot rem remember the name of right now, it has a, a feature that it mimics the monarch butterfly. So this is the monarch butterfly. And the monarch butterfly tastes very bitter. And so birds avoid the monarch butterfly. This butterfly has over time mimicked to look pretty similar to the monarch butterfly to deter the bird from eating it. And that's called mimicry. But what the bird has done has co-evolved with this change and has learned to decipher the difference between the monarch and this other uh, butterfly that's trying to mimic the monarch. So the co-evolution here is of the predator and the prey. The prey has tried to change so that it would be not seen by the, or not recognized by the bird, and the bird has evolved to be able to see uh, the difference between these two and know that this one is edible and this one is not. And so uh, this is what we call co-evolution. This can happen in a lot of circumstances. So here you have the beak of this bird and the really deep flower with um, that has to you have to have a long beak to get to the nectar. And so in that case, this is co-evolution of the flower and, and this happens a lot with pollinators and flowers that they will co-evolve together. The last one's parallel evolution, and this one's a bit difficult. Um, the key here and what makes it different than uh, convergent evolution is that these are closely related species that are in different but similar areas um, geographically. So, we're talking two species that are somewhat closely related, and so in this case we have flightless birds. Obviously all flightless birds have a common ancestor at some point, and, um, but they've, they've undergone similar genetic changes but at different times. And so we can see here in the flightless birds um, that, for instance, um, flightlessness has been found to actually have evolved multiple times through history. And so these birds here, um, the common ancestors here, aren't necessarily flightless. And the reason that we've been able to figure that out is because elephant birds are found in Madagascar and kiwis are found um, in New Zealand. And so they are the most closely related genetically which is not what you would think. You would certainly think the kiwi would be more related to the emu and the cassowary. And so that means that their common ancestor must have been able to fly because they got to New Zealand. And so um, the common ancestor here was not flightless. And so independently, the elephant bird and the kiwi have become flightless over time. And so they think, uh, based on, on this research, they think that um, Flightlessness actually evolved five or six different times throughout history, um, as well as gigantism of the birds. And so some of these birds are really, really big, the elephant and the moa. Um, the moa is also found in New Zealand, um, all extinct now. Uh, there are nine different species of moa, but they are all extinct now. But you can see that they're really not that closely related to the kiwi. And so that's a bit surprising. Um, and so we call this parallel evolution in that 
the gigantism here evolved and the gigantism here evolved separately, but that was due to similar selection pressures. And the same would be true of the flightlessness um, that these, so this sort of uh, phylogenetic tree is really an example of, of two things, divergent evolution and parallel evolution. And so we see, obviously these have diverged from common ancestors, but then we see where gigantism has evolved here and here in two different places. So one, it evolved uh, in New Zealand at some point and in Madagascar at some point. Both of these species have now become extinct, but it's still uh, worth noting that the, not only the gigantism, but also the flightlessness evolved multiple times in different places due to there being a, um, due to there being uh, similar selection pressures in different places around the world. So speciation, there's three modes of speciation. Um, this can get a little confusing because then we're going to talk about um, different types of isolation. So sometimes students get those confused, but there's only three modes of speciation, allopatric, sympatric, and parapatric. We did these in class. Allopatric means that they are separated by a geographic barrier. So a mountain, um, a canyon, an ocean, some kind of geographic barrier is separating the populations, which leads them, or could, doesn't necessarily, but could lead them to accumulate lots and lots of microevolutionary changes, which then could lead to a new species. Sympatric speciation is when the two species or the two potential species populations are uh, completely intertwined with each other and occupying um, the same area. Um, that's supposed to say area. <laughs> uh, and so they occupy the same area, but one, this happens a lot, one of them changes and becomes a new species. So I think a good example of sympatric speciation is, is polyploid, which is when um, a plant inherits an extra set of chromosomes. And so in doing that, it becomes a new species. And so this happens a lot with strawberries and things like that. Um, and so they can be with amongst others, but they just become a new species because of uh, inheriting this polyploid, this extra set of chromosomes. So that's one example. Parapatric speciation is when two populations only have a slight overlap. So they might exchange alleles every now and then, but not often um, uh, just because their, their ranges slightly overlap. So we call that parapatric speciation. And so here's kind of an example of that with Alec Patrick, our starting population is all together. This first step is that there's some sort of geographic barrier. And then over time, because of this isolation, this population changes, um, maybe due to a selective pressure that's not on this side. In Parapatric, we have um, migration maybe into a new area. And so then they, but then there's just this slight overlap between the adjacent populations over time, this, then because they're mostly here and interbreeding with each other, they undergo their own changes. In sympatric speciation, um, a portion of the population undergoes some kind of mutation or some kind of genetic change like that polyploid that I discussed. And so they became genetically separated from the rest. We have some different isolating mechanisms. So it's one thing to say that in order for speciation to occur, while we do say it can be geographic, it has to eventually lead to some sort of reproductive isolation. So we'll talk about all of these, but know that even if there's geographic isolation, eventually that would have to lead to reproductive isolation in order uh, for speciation to really occur. So um, especially with temporal and spatial but those oftentimes is exactly what happens. So we're gonna go through each of these, but each of these are ways that populations can be isolated from each other. So temporal, geographic, reproductive, and spatial. So with geographic, it's you know like we were just saying with the allopatric is that they are geographically separated from each other. Um, and due to that, this could be, do we think of a, a ocean or something like that, but it could also be habitat fragmentation. And so I could have two populations that because their fragment, their habitat is fragmented, they can't connect to each other. So oftentimes we have, um, humans have tried to create corridors between these habitats that we have fragmented. Um, it could also be a natural disaster. And so a natural disaster could cause populations to be separated from each other. 
Another isolating me mechanisms are is temporal isolation. This just means time. So that could be time of year or time of day. Um, and so these two species don't breed with each other because this one breeds in January through March and this one's March through May. And so because of that, their breeding season really doesn't overlap enough for them. Um, and so they've changed over time and become a different species. So this is an example of that really closely related, but their breeding time has caused them to undergo some changes that has that they're now reproductively isolated from each other. Spatial or ecological isolation is this idea that because they're occupying different habitats, even if they're in the same area, they won't breed with each other. So a good example of this are these anoles that are found uh, in the Caribbean. Um, and these anoles live, some live in the grass and the bush, some live on the trunk of the tree, some live in the middle of the tree, and some live at the top of the tree. And so they have lots of different adaptations based on where they live and what they eat. But that has also led to some different adaptations of these things here. And so these uh, pouches that are at the bottom is how they know who they're mating with. And so they all have different colors. And the reason that that's happened is because it's darker in some places. And so in the darker places, they would need a brighter um, pouch there in order to be seen. And so those pouches are now a different color for each of these anoles. And so now this giant, this crown giant might have uh, an orange one and one down here would have a white one. So even if they were to encounter each other, they wouldn't recognize each other. And so this has happened because they are ecologically or spatially uh, isolated from each other. And then the last one's reproductive isolation. Again, all of those other ones will lead to reproductive isolation. Um, but here, this could be due to the gametes not being able to, so kind of a little cartoon here, but the gametes not being able to recognize each other. So the egg and the sperm, the sperm can't penetrate that egg. And so that's a gametic form of isolation. Behavioral isolation, you can think of two birds and one singing a slightly different song, the other one doesn't recognize it. And so that would lead to some kind of behavioral, that's a behavioral isolating mechanism. It could be a mating dance as well. That would be another example of that. Uh, could be mechanical. So you have these two snails, one is uh, left and one is right. And because of that, they're um, their sexual parts don't fit with each other and they can't mate. It could be hybrid inviability. And so a good example of that uh, is that sheep and goats can mate, um, but their offspring are inviable. Um, and so they don't uh, survive for very long, if at all. Hybrid sterility, the best example of this would be a horse and a, and a donkey producing a mule. Mules are actually really useful animals in terms of they are hardy and, and strong, but they can't reproduce, and so they are sterile. And then the last one's hybrid breakdown, and this is an example of rice, but uh, two different rice plants. But when they breed them together, they get they do get an offspring, but then that offspring in the next generation breaks down and can't reproduce any further after one generation. So the, all of those are different types of reproductive isolation. In the end, it, it somehow reproductive isolation has to occur in order for speciation to occur. Populations that have this reduced genetic diversity are really highly likely to become extinct. And so an example of this, and we talked about this one in class, is female cheetahs. Um, that, oh, the cheetah population really only barely made it out of the ice age. And so their genetic diversity is very low. And one way that they've uh, been able to see that maybe that they've been able to maintain the amount, even the small amount of genetic diversity they have is that the females are mating with only um, or sorry, females are not mating with only one male. They're mating with many males, and those males are actually over a really wide range. So they're not just mating with males that are nearby. They're mating with males all over, and then every year male mating with different males. So more and more males. So almost every one of their offspring um, comes from a different father. This this helps protect them from disease, but it also helps protect them from other male cheetahs because male cheetahs will kill sometimes. Um, cubs that are not their own. 
And so because these male cheetahs don't know if it's their own or not, because she has uh, matings with multiple um, cheetah, male cheetahs, uh, they end up not killing any of them. So um, this has helped maintain the little bit of genetic diversity that does exist in the cheetah population. So as an example, here is an example of sort of a problem. Um, what type of speciation has occurred here? So we have generation one and the frequency of, of R is 0.7, the frequency of little r is 0.3, and then they both get to 0.5, and then at the end, everybody ends up being red here, which is the P, or the capital R for red. Um, gene flow has occurred through each of these generations. So there's been gene, gene flow. Um, and so what type of speciation would this be if there's been gene flow throughout each generation? And you're really looking for, are the populations, is it, could it be allopatric? So if it's allopatric, oh, I think I was supposed to say, hello, Patrick, from over the pond. That's how your sister remembers it's geographic isolation, I believe. That's from um, Bella. Thank you, Bella, for that. Um, if it's allopatric, there would have to be some sort of barrier, and we don't see a barrier in this picture. So um, it's not allopatric speciation, allopatric. And uh, if it is uh, parapatric, there would only be a small overlap. And it doesn't look like there's a small overlap. It looks like they're completely overlapped, which then leads us to say that this is likely um, sympatric speciation. And so that's kind of the example. You have to be able to look at allele frequency data and gene flow to determine that. And we'll do some practice problems with that in class. And then our last section here is here's another type of sort of data on gene flow over time. And so you can see here, this is a lot of data to sort of process, but there's um, this is a certain type of, of uh, wing, sort of wings. In a, and this is the speciation we're looking at. This is in the United States. So here's the range of this one in green, it is a, a host actually um, for a parasite. And then here's the range of the orange. And so there is this slight overlap here, which then leads to saying that it is likely parapatric. Uh, you'd have to look at this one a little bit longer, but I don't wanna make the video too long as it's already kind of gotten long. But you have to be able to look at data that they've given you to determine uh, what type of speciation has occurred. So you're really looking for where does it overlap or does it overlap? And is there some kind of geographic barrier separating them or not? Hopefully uh, you found this video helpful. And uh, last week was Diego's 12th birthday. So uh, I thought I'd leave you a picture of Diego with his birthday cake. And uh, let me know if you have any questions.